All right, let's take a look at a couple of buildings. This is um, it's a house by Walter Roberts in Virginia, and it uses a whole series of systems. You can see on the left-hand side an image from an old progressive architecture magazine. That's the south facade. And on the right, you can see a diagram about how all this works. So let's take a look at this. Um, you have a glass wall, and that glass wall is backed up by uh, a masonry wall. And if you look at that facade, you can, you can kind of tell the areas where it's got the masonry behind the glass. And so we would call that a trom wall, right, which is the masonry version of the thermal storage wall. And then, mm, on the other hand, that masonry wall has got some holes in it, right? So it has some windows in the wall. There's actually an external window and an internal window. All right, so then we've got glass coming all the way through the facade into the spaces behind. So that's a direct gain. So now we've got a combination of direct gain and thermal storage wall. And thirdly, you can also follow that little loop that goes from blue to red as the air comes up inside of the cavity between the glazing and the mass. And then that's circulated over to some other remote mass. That is, the mass is not on the side of the building that's collecting the sun. So that, that's the function of an air collector. So that wall is, has three different kinds of systems in it at one time. It also has what we call direct mass, and it has some indirect mass. So the direct mass is the mass that's right behind the glazing. And then the indirect mass is over there on the other side of the room, at least the interior of that, You'll see it's a hollow core mass, and that uh, mass is being heated only by convection. And when we heat a mass only with air, uh, it's, it's a convective heat transfer rather than a radiant heat transfer, we call that indirect mass. It still works, but it doesn't work as good because the heat transfer is not as good by convection. Okay, let's go to the next slide. You can see the plan. So really what we have, if you look at the plan diagrams there on the left-hand side, as you can see all of that uh, mass along the facade. It's sort of a thinner mass, but then there's a fireplace mass. There's mass on the interior of the building making a sort of enclosure in the kitchen. Um, and then there's a big, thick hollow core mass on the north side of the building, which is helping to heat the rooms on the north side. Well, again, they've got some thermal zoning, some heating zones going on. The living spaces, and the bedrooms are on the side that gets the most heat. The bathroom, storage, circulation, etc. those service uh, rooms are in that core along the north uh, side. They don't need as much heat, and they also serve as a kind of buffer to the colder north side of the building. If you look at the diagram on the upper right, you can see that it's a little more um, architectural now than the one that we saw before. And some of that heat is being circulated up into a greenhouse or an attic sun space, if you will. So the, the roof itself in, in portions is actually glazed. It's a great thing to do, especially if you have an attic that's not being used, right? You're not occupying that space. Or you could occupy it, as we said, part-time um, in the way that a sun space could be occupied during the times when it's comfortable to do so. So now we have the fourth system. Here's a building that has direct gain, it has thermal storage wall, it has air collector, and it has sun space. It has direct mass and it has indirect mass. It's an essentially like a, you know, in the plan you can see it's a, a massive building with a lightweight insulated wrapper. So all that mass is insulated, it's on the inside of the building, it can transfer heat back and forth with the interior spaces. And then you can see in the image on the lower right that they're using that as a, you know, using that masonry compositionally. They're using it aesthetically, using it to create a pattern and also a kind of a feeling and experience. And then if you just look up at the top of that, you can see that the horizontal um, structure of the floor is wood. So that's a really nice combination in a residential uh, construction, especially, is you can have vertical masonry and then spanning between that, you can use a lightweight wood construction. All right, if you take a look at the um, bundle 
called passive solar building in sun, wind, and light. That'd be in the printed volume. You'll find that there's two variations. There's a thin plan and a thick plan. And the thin plan bundle is more or less a building that's stretched out more on an east-west plan. It has more opportunity for more rooms to come in contact directly with the sun and to heat themselves. A thick plan would be a building that's multiple rooms moving from south to north so that some of the rooms have direct sun access and some of them don't. If you remember that eco-construction facility in Germany that I showed you with the sun space on the skinny south side, that would be a thick plan example. So um, to review, the bundles are a way of looking at problems that come up over and over again for architects. And whenever you have a problem that comes up over and over again, then we tend to begin to find solutions that work better than others. So in this case, we're asking the question, what's a passive solar building that has a thin plan? Um, the passive solar building is the pattern or the strategy, you might say, up at level six for the whole building. And then we're going to use three different scales below that, room organizations, rooms, and building systems to help build that. Inside the bundle wrapper, which is that heavy dashed black line, we have the strategies which are most likely to work most of the time in most buildings where you want to passively solar heat a thin plant. There is a second um, bundle, which is for the thick plan. And some of the strategies work for both thick and thin. Those are the ones that we call the core strategies. You can see those are the ones with the heavy solid black line around them. So in all buildings that need heat, you could use heating zones. All buildings that are going to use heat from the sun need to have some of their rooms facing the sun. So rooms facing the sun and wind. Direct gain rooms are probably going to work in both of those but uh, they're going to work best for the rooms that actually face the sun, of course. So some of the rooms in the thick plan and most of the rooms in the thin plan could be direct gain. You're always going to need some thermal storage, so that strategy for mass arrangement is really important. And then well-placed windows has to do with, you know, orienting the amount of windows so that if you need to collect sun, you're increasing the windows on that side of the building, and then you're using uh, glazing on other sides of the building, which are enough for daylight, but are not going to overheat you on the east and west in the summer, for instance, or they're not going to create too much heat loss in the, on the north side in the winter. The second set of strategies is situational strategies. In this case, those are the ones inside the wrapper, but don't have the bold line that work in both areas or both uh, variations. Things like east-west plan, for instance, and convective loops as a way of moving heat from one space to the other, adjacent spaces. Those kinds of strategies would work better for thin plan. They don't necessarily not work for thick plan, but we're going to say they're, they're more appropriate for the situation of a thin plan. And then the ones on the outside, like separated and combined openings, we'd call those refiners. They might help you, they might not help you, but look at it and you know you can you can decide whether that's going to help refine and, and and tune up your overall scheme. Now this only makes sense once you actually have read and understand each of the pieces. The lines are attempting to uh, tell you that there's a relationship between the strategies and in general the principle is that the lower level, lower complexity, smaller scale strategies help to build the larger ones and the Higher strategies help to organize a series of two or more of the lower strategies. Okay, that's a thin plan. Here's an example of a relatively thin plan building. This is the Shelley Ridge Girl Scout Center in Pennsylvania by Bolin Siwinski Jackson. Really a good firm you might want to take a look at. Um, on the right, you see the exterior of primarily what is a trom wall, but you can see it's a combination of trom wall and direct gain, with uh, more shading being useful over the direct gain apertures. And the trom wall itself has that delay and it can also potentially be either vented or shaded in between the layers. In this case, it's a thin mass trom wall, only about four inches thick. I think the idea there was that the Girl Scouts are not using this building late into the evening. It's a daytime use, and uh, 
evening but not late night use building. So you don't want the heat to be delayed too long. Uh, you want it to be delivered when people are going to be using the building and you can regulate that in part by the thickness of the mass. The exterior, you can see some of the shading and then down there on the right hand side of the exterior on the, the left image, you can see they also have a sun space. So again, combination of direct gain, sun space, and trom wall, but primarily a trom wall building here. Um, it really points out the distinction between the system as a kind of idealized concept so that you can understand how that piece of the architecture is working, and then the actual way that architects tend to combine those into multiple systems. And the multiple systems have advantages, right? So for instance, um, the direct gain is going to heat up earlier in the morning. The trauma is going to delay that heat to later in the day. So it's a nice combo. Interior on the left-hand side, kind of a low-res image. Sorry about that one. Um, that's of the sun space. And you can see they actually have a sundial, uh, graphic sundial. So uh, presumably, uh, the Girl Scout director can tell you how to read that, or the camp counselor, and you could find out what time of day or, uh, or season it was if you knew which one of those things was supposed to be casting the shadow, which I don't. Anyway, you can see that essentially it's kind of one big room on the lower portion of that, that plan that we're looking at. And then up on the upper portion, uh, multiple rooms, but those are entryways, restrooms, things like that. All right. Um, I think at this point was one where we came back for the second day and just wanted to make a quick review of those four systems. So we have direct gain rooms, the example being the Jacobs II house, also known as the solar hemicycle by Frank Lloyd Wright. This is where windows are your collection. The heat comes directly into the space. Structural elements, such as walls and floors, become the thermal storage. We need a massive material, typically, or we could use water. A lightweight material doesn't work so well for storing energy. The heat it heats up the mass. We insulate, close off the glazing area at night so it doesn't lose heat. And then as the surface is cooled down because the building is losing heat, the heat is uh, room released from the thermal storage medium, released from the mass, back into the space. And that has to happen on a 24-hour rhythm. Second system was the thermal storage wall. We just saw the Shelley Ridge Girl Scout Center as one example of a building that uses uh, a trom wall. In this case, um, the, the important thing is that the glazing has an airspace behind it and then the heat is absorbed into the thermal storage medium, in this case, a, a masonry wall coated with an absorptive surface. Primary uh, distribution, uh, particularly in the Shelley Ridge Girl Scout Center, um, you can see there's no vents there. So it's a, it's a radiant transfer through the mass. You can also insulate in the cavity between them at night or in the summertime. Sun space as an isolated gain system, the example being the solar house here in Berlin. Again, many of these buildings have multiple systems. We're emphasizing the sun space here in this building. Each apartment or many of the apartments, let's say, have two-story sun spaces. That sun space can then be um, isolated off or you can have doors and windows that open and connect that to the rooms that are behind. The sun space becomes the servant the spaces behind become the served space. So we have a concentrated area of solar collection, a concentrated area of thermal storage. The primary distribution is by radiation through the thermal storage, but can also be by convection if you open up vents or you open up doors and windows to connect the sun space with the spaces behind. Important principle, don't heat or cool the sun space. Then we have air collectors. We looked at two versions of that, the transpired collector on the left, which is really only for fresh air. It's a once through system. It's really good in buildings to preheat that fresh air if you have a high need for outdoor air. On the right hand side, an example of a site built air collector system. Remember the primary hmm, 
distinguishing factor here really is that the collection and the storage are isolated from each other. Therefore, you can cut off the airflow. For instance, in this image on the lower right, you see the vents or the holes in the wall, at least, uh, where we could have um, uh, a damper. We could shut off that airflow, that passive um, natural convection cycle. And therefore, we can stop any heat loss from happening back out the glazing at night. In fact, the, the wall behind it, as opposed to being a masonry like a trom wall, is actually an insulated condition. So really good for cold climates. Over in the passive solar building bundle, you'll find this chart, which gives you characteristics of different solar heating systems. I'm not going to go into the details of this. Um, other than to say, you've got some systems across the top, uh, right to left, direct gain rooms, sun spaces, thermal storage walls, and thermal collector walls. Then you've got one more system, which we haven't talked about, but we'll get to more when we get to passive cooling. That's a roof pond. Roof pond, just simple and short here, is the thermal storage is on the ceiling in bags of water, and that's why we call it a roof pond. And then we move insulation uh, to cover or uncover that so that it can either get sun or be insulated from losing the heat. The transfer is then by radiation through the ceiling. It works only at low latitude climates in the winter. It doesn't work well at a high latitude because of the angle of the sun. Along the left-hand side of this chart, you have various characteristics. Uh, and you can see the key on the upper left for you know, high or definitely for a big circle. Uh, going down to medium and low, and then no or none for the open circle. So we could say, depending on what you're interested in, you know, how efficient is the collector? Can I get a view to the south? Um, uh, does it provide for, you know, a migrational opportunity, a place to occupy? Um, is it more or less affordable? Um, and so forth and so on. Does it, does it have a high level of thermal comfort? Like a uh, roof bond is really good for that. Um, thermal storage wall is pretty stable. Um, the direct gain is the less stable interior, a little more cycle of interior air temperatures in the direct gain. So you can, anyway, you can get some kinds of pluses and minuses and compare those different systems. Now we said in the beginning that each solar heating system included some collection, some storage, and some distribution. The thing that's not on this chart, which we could also add, make it even more complicated, right, is something that happens in the summertime. How do we keep the heat off of that collection area or keep it from coming into the space in the summertime? And each system's got to have a different strategy for that. But what this helps us to do is to visualize that, one, there's a different uh, set of these kinds of systems. Um, and two, that there are options for each one of those. Uh, the shaded areas, uh, say starting at the top with direct gain rooms, the shaded path is just one example, just to show you that, okay, I want to have a direct gain room. Uh, I'm going to need some solar windows, right? Or you could see the other option is I could come down to skylights. Let's, let's go in the solar windows path. I go across and say, now I have some options for thermal storage. I could use indirect masonry, or PCM, meaning phase change material. I'd rather use direct masonry. That works better. If I have a really high solar savings fraction, I might come down to a rock bed and so on. So I could use various kinds of thermal storage. In the example, we're going to go with direct gain masonry. And then distribution, right? And the primary distribution for that system is radiant surfaces. The sur mass surfaces themselves are delivering the heat when it's needed. It's also possible that I could collect some extra heat and I could use some convective loops or I could use some forced air to move that heat over to another space. Right. So if I'm thinking about more than one room, I might also have the radiant surfaces in the space that's collecting the heat and I might use a second kind of um, distribution. So you can read a bit more about convective loops in, you got it, the sun, wind, and light strategy called uh, convective loops. You can also read a little bit about forced air um, in the strategy called moving heat from 
moving heat to co moving heat to cold rooms it's called <laughs> so that's it, it, like particularly in a thick building how do i move that heat over to the north side if that north side room doesn't get any heat from the sun okay so these are just to like help you look at what your options are and putting together any particular system you can read about that in greater detail in the solar buildings bundle now we said there's a thick plan and a thin plan variation here's the thick plan in the thick plan we've got we don't have a long thin building with a lot of south facing access right so we've got some rooms that can get sun some rooms that can't get sun we still have those same strategies of heating zones, room facing the sun and wind and so forth, just like we did in the thin plan building. Uh, so those ones that are the core strategies still work here. But now we have some other situational strategies, things like deep sun. Deep sun is a pretty neat strategy. I'll show you some of the examples of that in just a second. And it's really about manipulating the section or manipulating the plan so that you can get more direct sun to more rooms, even if they don't happen to be on the south edge of the building. We also might look at something like moving heat to cold rooms. Got it right this time because I can read it. Anyway, so we can use um, various ways of getting the heat from one place to the other in the building. All right, so that's, you can study a bit more about the thick plan bundle. Here's a building that's a bit thicker. This is the Solar Building 21, they call it. It's a research building in Portugal. The thing about the thick plan building, of course, not all rooms have solar access. We use some thermal zoning in this building, right? Plus, we need to borrow that heat and move it around somehow. In this facade, this is the south-facing facade, and mainly what you're looking at there behind those windows are offices. You can see that you've got direct gain windows, and then alternating in between that, some photovoltaics in the vertical plane. Those photovoltaics are making electricity. At the same time, the photovoltaic panel is not 100% efficient. It's more like 15 or 18% efficient. And what's left over with the other percentage is ordinarily waste heat that goes into the atmosphere. In this case, there's an airspace behind. So this is a combination PV system and air collector that recovers the waste heat from behind the panels. So combo system. There's the plan and the section. So you can see that that angled portion of the plan, which is facing due south, has offices, um, maybe a little break room, um, things like that. Then there's a corridor. The corridor is multi-height, has both stairs and uh, open space and corridor in there. Uh, and then back behind are larger classrooms and laboratories. So more people, more equipment, more lighting than the offices, um, and therefore more internal gains. So they're tending to heat themselves more. So the north side of the building in this case is uh, rooms that need less heat because they're producing more of their own heat. Rooms on the south side, low occupancy, only one person per office, right? Um, and you know, no research laboratory equipment there. So they need more heat and therefore they're on the south side. So we have the sun coming through in the section on the right of the section coming directly into the offices. We have massive floors. We also have some massive walls. We have the air collectors that are behind the PVs. Those are adding extra heat into the office spaces. Then we have louvered walls on both sides of the central atrium space, which is also our uh, linear circulation. It's heated at the top with some direct gain clear story. We're also borrowing heat by having that convective relationship through the louvered walls and doors that open into the corridor so that any excess heat or some of the excess heat that's uh, produced uh, in the South side offices can be shared over into the corridor and the eight, that atrium. And then we also have the atrium being heated from above. We have then a, a convective loop through the louvers into the spaces on the north side. So there you can see the interior. You can see those louvers going all the way up and down on the left-hand side and just over the doorways 
on the right hand side. Of course, when the doors are open, um, that's not that's even more of a convective connection. And there you can see the vents down below, the vents above, and on the winter section on the left hand side, cool air coming in the bottom, being warmed up by the waste heat coming through the partially translucent photovoltaics, um, and then warming up and coming out the vent at the top. In the summertime, here's the strategy for heat rejection. Close off those dampers to the inside, open up dampers to the outside so that then that warmed air cavity can be vented directly to the outside and behind that wall would be an insulated condition right so less of that heat probably a little bit of that heat may still come through the dampers It'd be nice if those were somehow better insulated but that's the logic let the heat in when you need it and keep the heat out when you don't and there you can see the concept for the summer Block use shading, use uh, exterior cavity ventilation to keep out the south side heat. Um, at the clear story at the top, there's an overhang to create that shading. Uh, and then you've got stack ventilation, which we'll talk about later, going from the edges in through the louvers, up through the atrium space, and out through the top exterior clear story at the top of the atrium. At the same time, on the lower right, you can see some uh, air coming in underground in what we might call an earth tube or an earth air heat exchanger. So that fresh air that's being brought into the building, even when the building is closed, you still need some fresh air, that can be pre-cooled by bringing it through the ground. Now we mentioned something about um, deep sun. This is from deep sun. Uh, in sun, wind, and light, that's the name of the strategy. And these are just some different ways that you can solve the problem of the multi-room thick building, uh, which has uh, no access or, you know, potentially the rooms on the north side don't have direct access to the sun. So we can solve that in plan. We can solve it in section in a bunch of different ways. The rooms that face south can be heated directly. Uh, and the, the little dotted areas um, are showing where we might have direct mass in plan. And then the hatched areas are showing where we might have mass in the walls. So that's, uh, you know, projecting up vertically. Or in the section uh, where we might have mass in the floors. And uh, so if you have one room that's heated and then you have another room adjacent to it, you can create a convective loop, right? You can move that heat without any fans or mechanical system from the room that's getting warmed to the room that doesn't have any south facing solar aperture and that's not too much of a problem. If you don't have a room that's adjacent to the one being heated that's when you're going to have to involve some kind of heat transfer medium like air or water and some kind of mechanical device like a fan and a duct or a pump. But we're trying to solve here the problem of heating all the rooms by just, just adding some architectural intelligence. We're trying to put more intelligence into the organization of the building so that the building itself becomes the thing that uh, is heating itself, right? And when you do that, you got a lot more money left over for doing whatever you want to do because in the end your mechanical system gets smaller, your ducts get smaller, your machines are smaller, they operate less of the time and so on. All the logics for why we want to um, first reduce all the loads and then provide for some of those reduced loads as much as we can with site-based free natural resources and then whatever's left over, we'll have a small mechanical system operating for fewer hours, and then we can use renewable energy like photovoltaics to provide for that energy need on site. So take a look in more detail. You can read about the, each one of these things uh, here about solar heating of thick buildings in that solar building bundle. Here's a thick building. Uh, these are two office buildings. This is in New Jersey. Uh, insurance office buildings. Uh, both are heated primarily. Uh, their passive aspect is their atria. The upper diagram shows uh, the north building and the south building. So 
you can imagine if you just took that north building diagram and you stacked it up on top of the south building diagram uh, you'd have the relationship between the two buildings so the north building that white area you can see is uh, coded as an atrium and it's on the south edge the south building has its atrium on the north edge so we'll have to look at why that is uh, i think i'm just going to project here that the architects wanted the social and entry aspects of both of these buildings to be facing each other. So one face is south, the north building, and then it can be solar heated directly. Uh, and you can see its sections, the respective sections of each one's down below. The south building, right, so the south side of both of those sections is on the left-hand side. I should have a little sun in there, but I don't. Um, Therefore, the um, south building, if we look at that lower right section, and you can see the sawtooth roof. So what that's doing is it still has vertical collection surface, but it's bringing in all that heat through the roof. So the north facing aspects of that sawtooth are insulated. The south facing vertical portions are glazed. So on the North building, we can bring that heat through the vertical wall, and you can see they even have louvers on top, so they could admit more sun if they want through the, uh, through the roof in the winter, or they can use those louvering systems to make sure that you're not getting that horizontal heat coming through the glazing in the summertime. You can also, so these are multi-story atriums, three, three levels tall, and then you can also see um, in the sections how there are kind of light slots, they call them, like a little skinny atrium that runs through the building and becomes the circulation, but it's also three stories tall, and it's also lighted from above. And uh, you can see in the case of the south building, it has vertical south-facing glass, so it's bringing some more solar heat down into the interior of the building. And that would be the building in the north atrium, the north building with its south facing atrium, I should say. Okay, and then uh, of course we've got to have mass in the building, we've got to have some kind of thermal storage um, for any kind of passive solar heating system. This is from the strategy called mass arrangement. And uh, there's two aspects to mass arrangement. There's two of these little matrices like this, one for heating and one for cooling. We're just looking at heating here for at the moment. And so if you look at the vertical asp uh, axis here under materials, it'll say HA. So H is for heating. A is just type A in the matrix or row A in the matrix, if you say. Uh, so we can have different kinds of materials. We can have water for thermal storage. The masonry can be solid. The masonry can be hollow, as we saw in the Roberts house. Uh, and then the, the other type is that we can use a phase change material. A phase change material is some kind of a salt solution or um, wax or something that is going to, uh, um, a, a lipid type material, any kind of material that's going to change typically from a liquid to a solid. Right? And so it has to be encapsulated in something so it doesn't get messy. Right? And it's going to change phase somewhere in the comfort zone, somewhere in the range where we like to have buildings operate. Right? And its advantages is that when a material changes phase, it's either giving up a lot of heat or absorbing a lot of heat. So it can do a lot of thermal storage in a relatively small amount of volume. And then across the top, we have walls, floors, ceilings, and then interior mass or remote mass. Right? So you can locate the mass in different places uh, within the building. And the matrix is not really a full matrix. There were too many things in here to squeeze all those diagrams in. So you'll see uh, HA1, that would be HA for water and 1 for walls. So that is actually that seed pod house is um, a solar decathlon project. So it's one of these little small experimental buildings. It's using a water wall. Water wall is a thermal storage wall system. In this case, you can see it's a vented water wall because you've got a vent at the bottom. Air can go up through the cavity and vent back out at the top. And then there's a kind of thin layer of uh, encapsulated 
water in, I don't know what they have, little bags or tubes, I guess, in there. All right, um, what would we really like? And you can see all the variations, right? What, what would we really like for solar heating? We would prefer to have the mass in the floor if possible, um, only because um, you're going to get the best heat transfer that way. The walls are second best, and the ceiling is our third choice, right? So usually in a passive solar building, you're getting some combination of walls and floors. You just have to make sure that that mass is actually exposed.